Hi, welcome. Thanks for joining us. We're here to talk about all things Martin Ro Martin Rose, and I'm here with this fantastic group of panelists um, who will introduce themselves. My name is Emily Zak. I'm TJ Sidhu. I work at the Face Magazine as junior editor. I'm Rona McKenzie, and I'm a multidisciplinary artist. I'm Milan Kumar. I'm fashion partnerships manager at Hype Beast. Hello, internet. I am Alex Kessler, junior fashion editor at British Vogue. Great, so we can get started. Um, I think just before we cover anything, I think first we have to just take a moment and um, really think about the collection. I feel like when I saw it last night, um, it just struck me as a London designer, Corden Bourne, this was her first collection shown outside London. And the significance of that and how she really rooted the collection in Florence and took a lot of references from the culture there. I think she had the local football team, um, in the show, a lot of like beautiful references throughout the show. The kind of soundtrack was the kind of uh, 70s, you know, Italian house music. Um, and I just, it really impressed me. I think some designers can be quite superficial in how they pull in references. And I feel like mm. she literally did tours around um, Florence to really understand the culture there. So I just wanted to get your take on how you thought she brought in the culture through her collection and how you feel like this might be different from previous collections. Well, I think something Martine has uh, continuously uh, done, you know, throughout her, her collection. She is like probably one of the most authentic designers out there, and I think so much part of that is because of her love for community, and <clears throat> I think her going to you know Italy or Florence even, and really bringing in the people who I think some some of the models like worked in local cafes and bars and football team. Um, that's something that she would do, and it, it, that's something she has been doing in London. But I think to then take it to Italy, it really shows how authentic she is as a designer. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that it's more than just like a superficial reference. Yeah, it's kind totally. of going deeper um, into the. Because she referenced like the spanking, like what was it like the. Um, it was like one of the punishments in like the 16th century or something. Oh, the and building was a was a place where yeah, punishments yeah. were being meted out. Right. Spanking, and I just like even just that <laughs> very sentiment. Very specific. Very specific. I think even just that sentiment was just so Martine Rose. You know, like it was just. It, it, it's a bit funny. It's a bit you know mm. it's subversive, and I thought the collection was so sexy as well. So mm. you sort of, you get that thread. I think for me, like I, being honest, I don't know enough about Italian culture, Florence culture, any of that to really pick up on that. If I'm just looking at the show, like, from, an, from my perspective, um, being here in London, but one thing that makes Martine, like, one of my favorite ever designers and someone that I will always admire and look up to is how she creates these characters who I believe, and I think in fashion there's like, I hardly believe anything anymore. Everything is like so orchestrated. Everything is so put together. Styling-wise, we have like this wave of styling that I don't see anyone dressing like that ever. And I think one thing that I just feel comforted by all of Martine's work, including this show, even though I know nothing about some of the references, and obviously if I read the context, I can then try and find it for myself. Mm -hmm. But realistically, I don't necessarily see like parts of Italy because I don't know the culture enough to recognize it. But what I do see is loads of people living life that I feel like I believe I'd see them on the street. Mm -hmm. I can see those people like, in life, just enjoying life, and that inspires me to do the same. Mm -hmm. And that's what I love so much about the collection, because there are all these really cool, like, like the necklace that says, like, enjoy your age, and, like, <laughs> these really random silhouettes put together on a body that I would never imagine would put those together, but I believe it. I believe that that person's doing that. I believe that they're all carrying these, like, gift bags, and I think she does it in a really non-over-commercialized way where she's pulled something and made it commercial for sales purposes, because it's, like, going to be a hype item, I think. She does it in a way that it's cool because it's believable and it's cool because it's relatable. And even though I wouldn't necessarily wear the garments like this, it's not my style, but because I believe it, I can then see how I could bring it into my own wardrobe and I mm. want to do that. So I think her going to Florence and doing this show is a testament to how well she can celebrate local people. Um, and it inspires me to just... Yeah, to be me, even though this looks nothing like me. And some of these characters, if I saw them walking down the street, I'd probably cross over. But I love that about it. I, lo I love that about it. Like, that's, yeah. that's what I think is super cool. Yeah, I think it's super authentic. And also, 
when you look at a Martin collection, this one or any one, there's something in it for everyone. And I think yeah. that's what's really nice about it because it feels accessible. A lot of collections you see, whether it's aspirational, meant to be aspirational or meant to be a certain character that you couldn't be, this one feels like it's for everyone. And there's also individual characters that she kind of puts together where you could see someone wearing the entire look. You could also see mm. someone just dipping into a pair of trousers, a T-shirt. Um, or something like that, or the shoes. Um, so that works really, really well. It feels seamless. It feels like it just all makes sense together. Even the fact that like we're referring to them as characters mm. shows that we're believing the story, like we're in the story. Yeah. And I think comparatively, a lot of what we see is like a projection of a visual. Like, cool, nice visual and that, but I don't. There's no story, and mm. I think. Mm. There's so much story here that we can go into. And I think like, it's so special for the characters that you were referencing that they have followed her for so many years. Mm. Yeah, it's been a <clears throat> it's been a real progression of these characters. You know, like some of these some of these models, like we've seen their face before, we've seen mm. someone like them before, um, but then Martine just continuously like elevates them in, in each collection to tell a different story. Mm. Which I think I think it's so special. Well, she's brought like some of the characters that she casts in the London shows as well, mixed in with some of the locals that you touched on, TJ, in Florence. But what I love is the fact that like, it, her collections are a celebration of London as a city when she shows here. And this one in particular, she chose to celebrate Florence as well in particular. And I know that when she went there, or I read that when she went there, she asked specifically to be taken around by locals to you know, understand like, how people are living and see what types of characters are being championed by locals. And she sort of plucked them specifically to be featured in the show, cast amongst the people that she would usually have here. So I, I kind of love like, the merging of the two cities, like, even the music, um, like it's obviously you know, there's Italian like dance music, but it's also mixed in with like, you know, London like happy hardcore kind of like 80s, 90s kind of vibes, and it's just like that the amalgam of the two just feels really seamless. Like it doesn't feel like it's a superficial blend of mm. you know the two cities. It's like she's celebrating both, and together it just makes sense. Yeah. Even that process is really playful. Yeah. Like, I love that. No one here, and in her previous collections, no one seems to be taking themselves too seriously. Mm. Just, she's just having fun with it. And I think, again, comparatively, like there's so much to take, everyone taking themselves so seriously mm. all the time. Yeah, and, like, I think bringing that play of like going on the buses or whatever and like actually taking in the city is that part of um, productive play that I've been thinking about a lot lately, not yeah. both in my own practice and just kind of when we're looking at what contemporary culture is. And I think that aspect of like taking the time to go and do that and then bringing that into the collection, um, you don't always get to see so, so visibly in the output. It's respectful as well, I think. Yeah. It's like you can have a sort of idyllic vision of what a particular city might want to mm. you know, project in your head like without actually being engrossed in it and going out onto the streets and having someone who actually lives there guide you. I think that's something that I really appreciate about her approach to everything. And even like um, in terms of the clothes, I mean, I can definitely see a lot of traditional Italian aspects sort of embedded into some of the, like the fabrications and the cuts and the silhouettes are kind of like, they're, you know, it's, 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 it's a kinky version of traditional Italian attire. Like, there's this, like, it's like a two-piece suit that is kind of, you know, like, to, to the naked eye, it just kind of looks like a traditional suit. But actually, if you look at it closer, it's a jumpsuit. And the back has, like, a little sexy slit. And it's just, like, something so Martine about that. I want it. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I love that one. Oh, no, you go. No, no. no, no. <laughs> yeah, as, as you were saying, you know, with that sort of slicing of tradition, Florence as a place is a very mm. traditional... It's also like a tourist. Like, yeah, you have to kind of scrape a few layers yeah, off to get to the real it's authentic core totally, of Florence. I mean, in terms of, like, architecture, food, like, mm. you know, just even, like, uh, gestures, everything, like, Florence is so steeped in tradition. Um, mm. It's why you don't see, like, you know, skyscrapers or, you know, mm. sort of flashy new builds. and But they don't want it, you know. They're very sort of... 
in that sort of mindset of like a, I don't know, I guess like a simpler time or whatever. But then you get someone like Martine coming from London and just sort of, you know, fucking it up a bit. Yeah. It's, it's so cool. Like, I, mean, I, think, I think that the kind of common themes are, you know, her authenticity and community. I think community is overused. It's become such a commercial yeah, term. I wish there was another <laughs> word I could use, but Mates. in her case, it's very much like, I like actually characters for me feels more yeah. real because as you said, she's sort of investing in that person as a whole person instead of like a, a look, mm -hmm. you know, that she has to get out. Um, but, you know, her, historically, she's always shown off the schedule, right? Mm -hmm. And in locations in London that were very much not in the kind of typical London Fashion Week kind of um, chain, whether it was a kind of, I know we were talking earlier, it was a climbing wall, whether, I think it's interesting sort of for me that in this way, it almost seems like not necessarily tame, but it feels more, um, you know, it's much more kind of set in the culture of, of Florence. So she sort of settled herself in, and, and I think Pitti is a really interesting venue, for, like, um, sort of place for her to show the collection mm. because it's, its history itself is sort of, as you say, so steeped in tradition and Italian craftsman, um, craftsmanship. But I just wondered, were there any, you know, pieces that you felt really stood out or that you wanted to kind of talk through? I know, Alex, you talked about the suit. Were there any others that you felt kind of had that subtle, sexy subversion? I mean, personally, as something that I want to buy immediately, <laughs> is there's a, there's a black Western shirt with fringing that she's basically like constructed out of satin. Uh, it's like paneled with satin and with sheer, yeah. I'm obsessed. I, from a very personal shopping perspective, <laughs> this is what I want to buy. <laughs> what I really liked what she said backstage about the the fringing is that she said I, w I want it to I wanted it to look like it's been through a shredder. Mm. Mm. I thought that was like you know, it's not so. It's just, it's just so mighty. It's so mighty, <laughs> but it's just so beautifully constructed, <laughs> which is what I think that sort of like yeah, the duality of that is basically, yeah, emblematic of Martine's whole vibe. It's like, it's perfect, but it's fucked up. Yeah. <laughs> what I thought was cool was um, on some of the shirt, T-shirts, it had the logo Eros, which is rose backwards. Mm. But Eros is actually like a Greek god of like er erotica, I think, Love, yeah. <laughs> which kind of fits in with everything else. You know, we talk, sat here talking about it being kind of um, sexy and like slits on the back and things like that. I just thought that was kind of genius and to flip it around like that. I don't know if she's actually done that before on t-shirts. I don't think I've seen that, but um, I thought that was a really cool nod to it all. Did anyone pick up on the kind of the toy silhouettes? She talked about kind of mm. toy, um, I'm thinking of the kind of pink puffer, the kind of waddled sort of... I think on the knitwear, yeah. the knitwear for sure, like the structure of it um, and the weight and like how they kind of... Like the boiled knits. Yeah, the, the models like fit into them as opposed to them being fit to the models, I think is really interesting. Mm. Um, I love the accessories. Like I think the bags are incredible, the gift bag, like I believe that for sure. Um, and like the folded like football boot bag, sick, love the shoes. I just think she just killed it. Like that <laughs> gift bag moment. I love look 11 also, which is one linking back to like Florence. I don't know who that is, but I believe that he like exists in Florence. And like I could see so many places in which in my mind of what Florence is, where it is. Um, I love also the look, I don't know what number it is, also the leather trousers there, also fab. Mm. But the look that has like a tie and then a, the bottom of the tie looks like it's the belt buckle and I don't know if it's one piece or the belt and the tie are like separate or together. Um, I think it's that one, look 24. It looks like the tie kind of goes into the, the colours are the same and it could almost be the tie. Um, and I think that was really sick and I'm really, I don't think I would ever say I would enjoy a tie moment, but the way that, <laughs> that I just think that's really cool about it. Like I believe yeah. this yeah. person, he looks, like he's really trying to like stunt and look fly, but maybe only had this, and so like I'm gonna make the most of it. Um, and that's what's really fun. That's really fun for me yeah. to look at. Well, the, um, the jumpsuit was wicked. Yeah, like, yeah. A literal jumpsuit. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. you have to take the whole thing off if you want to go to the loo. Perfect. Yeah. That's like that. That is, you know, that's sexy, isn't it? Look at that. Yeah. It's so cool. Very cool. Um, she also does camo as well, really brilliant. Mm -hmm. I love a bit of camo. I love a good camo moment. But I think it's, where is it? Somewhere. I Somewhere. Think, yeah, I think yeah, it might yeah. be like the, one of the first looks or something. I think it was cool that she Maybe showed that because... <laughs> I think it's the last one. So. <laughs> talking about like craft and Italy and Florence and like the idea of what craft is, I think often when we talk about craft, we have to think of like 
obviously important like Japanese craft like you know mills and like those that type of craft and we have some designers here in London obviously that work with craft in a different way and I think Martin's one of those where like would maybe get not necessarily referred to as a craftswoman or a craftsperson but you can we can see so clearly like how much craft there is in in narrative and the narrative and the clothes actually marrying up and mm. actually being garments that you can actually wear in real life um, and buy and wear and they still retain the feeling of the show or of the collection or of the season whereas so, many, so often like maybe you pull a piece or buy a piece and you get it home and you wear it and it's, it's lost all of what the magic of the show mm. and the moment has yeah. and I think that takes full craft to be able to make a garment, fabricate a garment, like shape it and for it to retain itself even once it's completely out of the context of of the show. Mm. Well, I think off the back of what you're saying, Ren, it's like that it, it's, it's an ode to the craft, but she's still delivering it with such conviction of her own, you know, aesthetic mm. and her own ethos and like the, set, the embedded sense of humour, like that's just not lost in the slightest. Mm. And that just, it takes a true visionary to be able to deliver that and not have to scream and shout about it or do it in like a performative way that's to get like Instagram attention or whatever, because yeah. she doesn't need to do that. No. You guys have all touched on, I think that's a really <clears throat> good point, because you've all touched on kind of her authenticity and her kind of um, like whatever she's creating kind of goes all the way to the core. It's not this kind of superficial layer. Yeah. You believe it. But I think it's interesting because she, you know, if you looked at her career trajectory, it's it's much more of a kind of organic growth, however you want to think about that. I think in London, you know, London is known as the capital of like fresh new talent and young talent, and that, that's brilliant. But what happens when you're sort of middle, you know, you're, you're not the sort of next new thing, you're sort of maybe getting into the kind of middle part of your career. And I think what she's been able to do is maybe because of her slow burn or the way that she's built her career slowly and held on to her, she's been able to kind of craft her vision in this very, authentic way. And um, I just wondered, you know, how do you sort of see that playing in? Maybe that's partly menswear. I think maybe it's slightly less pressurized in some ways. But how do you see her kind of, I think she's developed hugely, but like she's been very strategic about her collaborations, for example, mm -hmm. which probably not only helped her financially, but helped her build her, her own brand and her own brand vision in not such a pressurized environment. Yeah. I think it's testament, sorry, I think it's testament to, to her as a designer to kind of be still, I mean, we're sat here talking like so highly of her, what, maybe 12 years into her career, and she's mm. had uh, the namesake brand for that long. Yes, the collaborations make it, kind of bring it more to the mainstream, if you want to use, for, for lack of a better term, um, because it allows Martine Rose to be in front of other audiences, but she really deserves everything that she's kind of worked on and built, and, you know, she hasn't had the kind of, um, standard route, let's say, to kind of her stardom, which would be the big uni, straight out of uni, fashionist, straight out fashionist, like mm -hmm. onto the big stage. She kind of did it over, I think it's been about 21 years since she graduated, mm -hmm. which is just crazy. And I think that's why she deserves everything she's kind of getting. And um, all the rumors that circulate her as well, she, she fully deserves them, so. Yeah, I think like, you know, when it comes to designers, there's <clears throat> such an obsession with youth and mm -hmm. being young and being as young as you possibly can uh, <laughs> you know it's so boring also having like a vision like done yeah. and ready and like you doesn't know, don't I, change it well totally <laughs> and I'm like, you know when you're putting out collections at the age of let's say 24 25 just finished uni mm. um that you know that sort of system that you yeah. just touched on how do you have enough experience to really mm. level up and you know show something and i think that's what makes Martine shows so sort of captivating is because there is so much life experience in it. Mm. Mm. Whether it's like, you know, the acid house raves that her, <coughs> that her sisters went to or, yeah. you know, the, the football terraces or, you know, all these kind of references that she puts in it, it's life experience. Mm. Um, and, I, I, you know, I think she's, she's testament to the fact you don't have to be 24 in order to be successful. Mm. And I really wish we would just get out of this whole, you know, yeah. headspace of you're over it once you're 30, you're not. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, Martin, I think one of Martin's like, when Martin really started picking up, I think she was like, what, like 34 or something? That's amazing, yeah. like what, you know, I th yeah, but I guess it's a 
systematic thing, isn't it? <laughs> you know, probably it's a bit of by design and also probably somewhat by necessity, right? I think, but the fact is that maybe as a, as a design model or as a model for young designers, I should say, it might be worth looking at that slow burn as a, as a more sustainable way of developing your aesthetic and your vision in a more kind of slow burn. But way. then like, money comes into it. Yeah. Like, yeah. How do yeah. you afford... How do you afford to do the slow burn? And I think Martine's probably, again, like to completely agree with um, everybody else on like, she's worked really hard, she stayed true to what she wants to do. And she's like probably fought through so many moments of feeling like, should I even bother continue? Because people probably aren't even, the industry is not being supportive. And really, as TJ says, like the industry, so, the whole way that it works is so not supportive really of new people. It's just like, how hot can you be? And, and you, you fry up and then before you know it, you're burnt and it's yeah. you're 27, you know? Yeah. And there's no, then it's so hard to find like a job in design or it's so hard to like sidestep and progress. And like, it must be really disheartening and really frustrating a lot of times where people have put so much work in and have popped off. And then as soon as you popped off, the industry has dropped you like that. And yeah. I think it, it's a byproduct of her, you know, like, clear hard work and focus and motivation and drive and perhaps grounding family, communi the community is in her actual close people who maybe when she's having a bad day she can call. Having those people to like stand by and allow her to continue and pick her up and her own self-motivation but I think so much more needs to be said about the way the industry is and everyone still allows it to thrive in that way. Like not Again, you kind of mentioned earlier about Martine sometimes showing off schedule, sometimes not, like her doing pity and all of that and of course like it's great to show off schedule, but perhaps if there was infrastructure and support for her to show on schedule, that may have been something that she may have wanted to do. I don't know, yes or no, but like, I'm sure the support probably wasn't there. It's expensive to do those things. Like, the rate at which you need to keep up is unattainable unless you've already got tons of money or got someone backing you. And like, I think it's amazing that she's done everything that she's done and she keeps going and she's done all these amazing collaborations and hopefully Martine Rose as the brand will outlive all of us anyway. Mm. But if the industry was smarter and kinder and actually wanted to be slower, then I don't think it would be just her that we can talk about in this way. Yeah, no, agreed. I, I mean, think, I sorry. Oh, go, please. Oh, no, sorry, I'm late. <laughs> I, I just think off, off of what Brennan just said, I think in terms of this whole notion of having to like make it into like superstardom as a designer at a very early age is it's just unrealistic and it's also quite a new thing because I think some of the greats like in in the past, like you know, like Lagerfeld and even Tom Ford, they, they didn't actually propel themselves into the like the status that that we see them as now until they were like in their forties. And it's like it's not necessary for people at, at when I was twenty-five. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Like, I don't think I would have understood how to manage a business and how to sustain a business without building you know, an understanding of where I want to take my career or where I want to take my brand. But I also think with Martine, she's just not been reliant on the hype or the validation mm -hmm. from publications. She's kind of like, her success is obviously off of her vision and her ability to deliver consistently, but it's also the fact that she's got a dedicated fan base who are obsessed. And because of that authenticity, you can't buy that obsession. You can't convince someone to be obsessed off the back of a review or you know some hyped up Instagram post. It's, it's like a, a legitimate, fan base that will spend money. Also because of the, the actual quality of the garment, mm. which is the bit that slips, like a designer can pop off and then you go to like DSM or Selfridges and you're like this, feel it. And you're like this, it like feels cheap, feels yeah. tacky. Yeah, you buy something from Martine and I still got things I bought years and years and years and years ago and they still look fantastic. Yeah. And that's yeah. what also maintains and keeps. And you also, I think when people are trying to sell to stores, you want it to, you want it to get profit, you need to be able to make enough money so mm. maybe use cheaper fabrics and yeah, the, the fabric, that, it has to feel good on the skin. It's a garment at the end of it, and it's supposed to be something we can wear. And I think that's also why. Sorry to cut you well, there. Exactly, and she doesn't scream and shout about, or she doesn't have to. Like even you know, the fact that she was in consult, a consultant for Balenciaga's first menswear show that Demna did, like, no one really knew about that until like, a couple of years later when she let it slip in a Vogue business article. And it was like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's like she didn't need to tell people that, but she did basically. I mean, I'm wearing this boxy blazer and it's, 
it's like off the back of something that she put out into the, mm. into the universe and she didn't need the validation of being like, I came up with that. Not that she came up with it, but she like sort of reframed it for contemporary style. And I, and I think that's just like incredible. Like who else could say that without having to, you know, scream and shout about it? Do you guys think that menswear sort of as a, <clears throat> almost like a bit of a haven for a lot of this, I think these young talents, it almost feels that, I don't know whether it's just that it's a smaller, slightly smaller kind of um, cadre you're dealing with a kind of, but it does feel like it's maybe a safer haven, a place to kind of grow. I mean, you can see so many talented designers, female and male, that are kind of finding their home in menswear. I mean, why do you think that is? I think women's wear can feel so pressurized and hype. All the sort of things we talk about, it's like the opposite of this slow growth. It feels like you have to you know, make so many collections a year and eat right off the bat. Is, do you think some of that's just a sort of unique to menswear or the culture around menswear? You talked about the fan base. Um, what do you think about that? It sort of has drawn so many, I'm just thinking of like, you know, quite a few, especially we, you know, women designers yeah. um, that have come to that space. I think maybe there's a lot of pressure for women's wear, this is just my opinion. I just think there's a lot of pressure for women's wear designers because there's such a legacy kind of element attached to it in terms of like big brands and sales and the way that women dress. There's a lot of history in how people perceive what women should be wearing. And so there's a lot of pressure that comes with that within sales and within it probably more from the suits that aren't actually the people that are creative or buying anything that's being made. Whereas in menswear, I think that's kind of like a new sort of area that's it's got a lot more like opportunity for play and I guess um, a, a lot of opportunity for someone to come and make an impact without you know, like suits breathing down your neck. But that's just my opinion. I also think the traditional codes of menswear... <coughs> sorry. Well, uh, <laughs> yeah, I think the traditional codes of menswear actually haven't changed that much historically mm. as well. Mm. They've been reinterpreted. You know, Martine's a really fantastic example of this, where she's taken, like, you know, very traditional codes like a blazer or, you know, just a simple pair of trousers, but she's subverted them and twisted mm. them and changed the construction. But at its core, it is still a suit jacket. It yeah. is a pair of trousers. Whereas I think the sort of trend cycle of women's wear changes so rapidly. Mm. It's constant. Um, not, that's not to say that you know, the same doesn't go for men's wear, but I do think, I, I, I feel like the trend cycle for men's wear is a little slower, but this is where we're in like a really sort of exciting time. We sort of have been, I guess, for like the past two years, you know, now we're seeing sort of, uh, skirts in menswear, mm -hmm. and you know, diff uh, more women are buying menswear. More women as well. are, yeah, yeah, totally. Like, That's what I was thinking though. Like, yeah. is it perhaps that the bodies and the identities that can fit on what is we typically call menswear is much broader? Much, a lot more people can fit into it and like wear it and shape it and style it to fit however they want to dress. Whereas, like, what we say women's wear is like a lot more specific for specific bodies mm. and specific people, and so. It's just much less people that can get involved in any one brand or any one thing, even if, like, I don't know, some designers like TJ and I, we could love the same garment, but really only it's only going to be able to fit my body. Whereas in menswear, we could both play around in different ways, you know? And so I think maybe it's also just a scope of how it fits, who it fits. Um, I think what's also... I don't know the data on this, I could be shot in the dark, but I think collaborations work a bit better for menswear. So it gives you that longevity as a business in terms of maybe shoe collaborations, things like that. So if you're looking at it, I mean, to run a business for 10, however long it's been, sorry, 10, 12 years successfully and grow it and also sell a part of it off to, you know, tomorrow and things like that, mm. she's clearly done an amazing job at that. And the design element is one thing, but actually to run a successful business is a probably the more important bit in a way because without that you can't design so i think menswear has a bit more opportunity for commerciality maybe um speaking to the same point that it can be worn by women and men as well but also the collaborations can go a bit further potentially um, and there's a lot of money in collaborations so it definitely helps um for sure i feel like i have every bit 
of Martine collab. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> also, there were just more women's wear brands like this. Just yeah. mm. it's very saturated. There it's were so, so saturated. many. Yeah. If, you, if you're looking for something like that's not just standard, you have so many options. Whereas in men's wear, you don't. Mm. And the trend cycle, like it's it's a lot, but it's also very repetitive. Like I think, um, in terms of, I, th I think m men's being more experimental or more playful, I guess, is quite. A, like it's, a, it's a newer concept and so I feel like there's a lot and, and I think at the moment as well there's a lot of celebration of that which is great and I think my, it's, a lot of it is testament to someone like Martine. Yeah, I also feel like there's, there's a, a lot more space to be a bit more experimental as well in mm. menswear just because it hasn't been for so long and I feel like you know, menswear has always sort of treaded on this quite safe, you know, it's, quite safe and then every so often you'll get a designer who's like maybe slicing up a suit or you know cinching a waist on a blazer or whatever <laughs> do you know what I mean <laughs> but it's kind of like it kind of ends there uh, <laughs> but I feel like with menswear you know we were just talking about Aaron Esch for example yeah it's a really fantastic example of a of a menswear designer who is you know sort of re, re, restructuring the codes and I feel, yeah, I feel, I feel like less has been done in menswear, so there is still room to room for these designers to sort of make an impact. Mm. Whereas women's wear, um, well, what more is there left to do? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, so and also I think women's wear, is, there's, there's a lack of, like, breadth in sizing. So I like a lot of women's wear, but I can't wear it because right. I have broad shoulders and it looks ill-fitting on me but in terms of like fabrications and the style there's some things that I wish I could wear yeah. and it's unfortunate there are some women who can't wear women's yeah. well precisely yeah, and yeah. it's and, and I think there is something very wrong about that <laughs> but I guess obviously there's limitations as to like what kind of you know how much product can be made and how much people can stretch but again I think it also needs to filter down from like you know like magazines mm. and stores and like mm. If like <clears throat> magazines, for example, can't shoot if the sample doesn't exist, but then the designer's not going to make the sample if you know no one's going to borrow it, yeah. mm -hmm. or like the you know stores aren't going to need to, to grade it and to mm -hmm. that size or whatever. Like there are so many things that like I think if publications made like a, you know more of an effort to shoot you know broader, wider mm -hmm. um, in terms of like varied casting and like style and all of those things. Um, then perhaps it would filter down to where it's worth it for the designer to actually t to show that and to do that. I think it, yeah, it's part of it needs to come kind of top down. I think especially um, smaller designers get all the ag of like, you need to be like super inclusive, super diverse, yeah, da, da, yeah. da 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 da. Whereas like, they're the ones who have the least capacity to do it because probably have the least money. Um, and it does come down to finances, part of it. Um, but bigger designers, more established designers, don't really get that stick because they're in their own world. Yeah. Um, and I think that's kind of across the board in arts in general, mm. not just fashion. But um, again, the support really isn't, it's not really always there. Mm. I think like the most radical thing that, you know, these big brands can do is, is to be inclusive, but actually mean it, you know, and actually yeah. send yeah. down models, mm -hmm. um, you know, in, increase the sizes of their samples. Yeah. Um, and not just at the show. And not yeah, just yeah, yeah. Yeah. it needs it's to, yeah. Yeah. yeah, you know, and just like forget all this like box ticking, you know, yeah. exercises that we see yeah. for two seasons, and then you know, just sort of forget that it never happened. Yeah. Um, that is probably the most radical thing that could happen right now in women's wear, and we're seeing like snippets of it, but but mm. wasn't last season atrocious, like in terms of like casting and sizing? I think that we had a moment where we were starting to shift towards a more like authentically inclusive sort of representation and then last season I just remember looking at the show as being like but I think to even make it more authentic like more designers and more the mm. scope of designers need to get a little bit of airtime yes. because it can't be the same designers won't suddenly be able to be authentic like because it's not their story so we need broader scope so that we can see the authenticity and like nobody wants to give up their place nobody wants to budge no one wants to share, yeah. their, their, share their seats still yeah. um, <laughs> still like designers yeah. like you know, all of the people who have a lot of space don't want to give their space up for someone else to show something, and that's the only way that we're going to move forward. Absolutely, and also authenticity and representation shouldn't be a trend. It shouldn't be no. something that's of a moment. No, it should think. be ingrained into that, the DNA of brands or DNA of the industry. Right? And mm. culture. Culture, yeah. 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 Like, I think as we were discussing, like, characters is something that should be championed more than... Mm. 
an archetype. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So pulling back for just a minute, just pulling the lens back, because I think that's, I think it's really interesting to sort of see her, she's really led the way for I think quite a few of the younger female designers in the menswear space. So you can think of Grace Wells Bonner, obviously, and Lou Dalton, and there's so many others in that space, I think, that are maybe there because of Martine, or also, you know, still, she's very much a contemporary within that space. But I think it's really interesting seeing menswear from a female perspective, and I think Martine also talks about how she, you know, she was very interested in how designing menswear, you know, thinking about it as a way of expressing sexuality and, and sexiness. And, I'm just very interested because, I mean, without going too far into the, the sort of men's designing for women, I think it's just interesting seeing how women designing for men can be different. And um, just, I guess we're getting close to the end of our panel discussion. So any kind of last thoughts about where Martine sits in that space, how she's been influential, um, how she thinks, you think she might continue to be influential in defining the space? I think she dresses, uh, she creates clothes for people and I think it's not specific to a gender, and I think that's her ace of spades. Mm -hmm. She considers style as an overarching thing to access as opposed to this is for this specific category, and I think that's why she's won everyone over. It's, it's, it's for everyone. I saw a comment on Instagram yesterday after the show that um, said that she was underrated in her space, which I think it's quite interesting because if you do look, take a step back and actually look at everything that goes on, there's definitely a case for that. Mm. I think she needs to be on the higher stage doing what she's doing. And I think we all know <laughs> probably where that, where that should what be. Are you about? <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I think she deserves it. She she fully would smash a job like that. And yeah, yeah, it's probably time now. Do you know what's great though is that uh, totally agree. You know, she's definitely be on. You know elsewhere um, but, but I think what's really great is in an age of Instagram social media etc you know designers are now so sort of it, it, designers want to be famous you know they want it's not just sort of about their brand they they themselves want to sort of become like you know celebrities whatever and that's been going on for like 20 20 odd years or however long um, but Martine she's not sort of you know on the red carpets she's not you know sort of putting up selfies every other day. She's very much like behind her brand, which I think mm. is so... Unusual. Unusual. <laughs> but I also yeah. think that's so a bit unusual. because... And she doesn't even bow, you know, sometimes she doesn't bow no. at her shows and things like I that. I think the thing about <clears throat> designers needing to be more frontal is also out of necessity. Like mm. the designer now mm. needs to basically sell their own brand, yeah. be yeah. the brand, like, you know, how many, it's always, tell us about you. Like it can't just be about the clothes. Similar to music in a way, musicians yeah. can't just be behind the scenes and never appear. And I think designers have been projected to that level where it's for people to buy into the brand, they need to buy into the designer. So yeah. as much as I agree that like, you know, some of it is a personal, all about me, myself and I kind of thing, but a lot of it is probably also strategic because that's how you get people to buy your thing now. Um, and I think it's perhaps a personality thing that Martine hasn't done that or doesn't necessarily do that. I mean, I guess on the, on the flip, I would love to see more of her because mm -hmm. it's inspiring for me and for others, for all of us probably to be able to see her more. But um, I think she balances it well, like when she did that family campaign and mm. she pops yeah. up at moments when, when we need to see it. It matters and maybe for her. When it's yeah, exactly, her. exactly. And I think that's super important. I think going back to your point about her being a woman designer designing menswear, I think more than that, kind of to your point, uh, what she creates shows us what we could have more of if we all took a little let leaf out of her book. It doesn't really matter what the story is, it's just believe in our stories and and make them, put them on the stage. And I think that's the most important thing. Um, I'm sure a lot of people who buy into her brand because they go into a store and buy it, aren't buying it because of what it is. They're just buying it because they connect to it. And that's really special. Also something you said really reminded me of when I see her clothes, they seem joyful to me. And they, it seems to me that she still enjoys it, enjoys creating them and enjoys the process. And I love what you said uh, earlier in the discussion about how she had kind of found a space to have this creative play and she was diving in and, and there was something for her that she still, it's clear that she enjoys it and that comes through. Mm. Um, and I hope that that's something that I would hope for other designers they can take another leaf out of her book there too because there is something really powerful in taking that moment to reflect and, and enjoy that process yourself as well. I think they also need freedom to do that and the industry needs mm. to support that. I don't think it's as easy as like people just not doing it because they don't want to. I think is 
Yeah. They're not allowed to. They have to be constantly churning, constantly pushing, constantly on top of it. Yeah. Um, and I think that's an industry thing. The industry needs to allow people the freedom, the ticket to have space. And perhaps we're seeing it because Martine's been going for a number, number of years. Mm -hmm. And now she's at the point in her career where she can do that. I don't know if she was able to do that earlier. Yeah. Um, right. So I think it's a two sides kind of thing. No, you're absolutely right. She talks about it, how she said she wasn't very business minded. Mm. And she realized she had to start becoming more business minded. And that, I think that was right before she started her collaborations uh, with Nike and then with Balenciaga. So I think clearly, she, uh, to your point, she, some of those collaborations, those very profitable ones, mm. allowed her to have the space to do that. Um, mm. But I do think that joy comes through the clothes, which is partly where I think we're all so excited about them. And sometimes that doesn't happen. You can feel this kind of like, just where is the energy there? Um, and I think Martine really does bring that. Um, and she's just so cool. Mm. <laughs> I feel like her show is like in the most last... basic way. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> but I think, yeah, I mean, even like, you know, her show in September, which was in a, uh, a, a previous, like, gay bathhouse kind of thing in Vauxhall. Mm. And you could literally, you could, like, you could literally smell the latex. <laughs> well, I was, it was sexy. It was like, every collection is like, you know, a bit of hedonism. Yeah. Bit of, and I think, you know, in these sort of times where the world is burning, you know, mm. I think Mar Martine's a really fantastic antidote. She does make you feel quite playful and quite youthful mm. and joy. You know, it's <clears throat> all these different sentiments. Mm. Yeah. The music. Like, so horny. So, yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 it's so house, good. Hello disco, yeah. like, all the good stuff. But that's the thing, I don't know anything about any of that. Don't know anything about rave culture. Wasn't there, wasn't, don't know anything about that and I can still connect to it. Mm. And that's like... That's special. Yeah, that special. that's a fabulous, well-told story. I think as well, just seeing, like, at, after that show, when her family and everyone, would, like all the people that she cast, were just like running up to her and embracing her, and she was just like so human and so endearing, it was like it just makes so much sense, you know? Like the clothes and the person really match up. Love it when things match up. Yeah, <laughs> beautiful thing. Love it when it just fits. Yeah. <laughs> But I think this collection, I think she talked about it being kind of a celebration, and I'll so be kind of our, um, just to wrap things up, but it felt like a celebration, and it also felt like kind of a party, which I think mm. we, we mm. all needed after the last couple of years. Yeah. But it also was like a little bit kind of off-center, a little bit, which is exactly the kind of release and the celebration that we actually need. Because, um, you know, it's been a hard couple of years, so having that, celebra that kind of celebration where it's just a little bit kind of it's twisted somehow at the same time just feels so right for the moment totally and i think because she does show off schedule you never know when the next martine shows yeah. mm. so that so you know yeah i mean you know the show in september like everyone went back to like the royal Vauxhall tavern after and it was mm. just all it felt like a proper celebration mm. you know everyone's just drinking pints smoking fags like <laughs> just really enjoying enjoying the moment because you don't know when the next when the next martine show is going to be and um and she was loving it you know you always see her like with her family yeah. and just just being cool. It's so lo <laughs> it is lovely. And also, I think these are clothes that you want to party in. Like, I would go out in every single look, probably. <laughs> I think, like you said earlier, like, there's something, I think it was you that said it, yeah, like, there's yeah. something for everyone and there's something for every moment. Like, we talk a lot about it being, like, sexy and that, but also if you just really just want to live your normal life and go, like, walk your dog or, like, go see friends, mm, it, doesn't, yeah. it doesn't have to be extra like the clothes yeah. are the clothes give enough that you can just be in them and, and relax and um i think that's what's so special about it to keep that all within her world and her framing but also have something for every day is so special like mm. can't think of many people that are able to do that well great thanks so much everyone um thanks for joining us and thanks for tuning in